Good morning, friend. Good morning. Good, morning. Good morning. to be here this morning, and, and I think I'm in, I, I am an intruder on Brother Neville's time. I'm sitting back there with his, getting his text together, and I walk in, he starts holding up his text and said, well, <laughs> it reminds me of years ago, he used to be a colored brother down here named Brother Smith, Sister Cross. They were very good friends of mine, and when I walk into the building at night, the old fellow, he, he had a white mustache, don't know whether any of you remember him or not, and um, he would be on the platform, you know, and all of them would be singing, It's a highway to heaven. And Brother Smith would be just set like this, you know. And I'd walk in the back door, there's a little girl, kind of real dark, she used to sit in the corner, and she'd start clapping her hands, they'd lift him up, that song, you know. They put their own melody to it, you know. And then over the next corner, be somebody else says, Come in again, lift him up. Well, that's what I, they'd sing when I come in the door. I just love that bunch of people. And so, old Brother Smith sat back there a little bit, you know, and he was kind of a quiet sort of fellow. He'd say, come in, Elder, rest your hat. <laughs> rest yourself, rest your hat. <laughs> come in, Elder, rest your hat. You get up there, and I tell him where he started off, I was in for it. He'd say, well, as he says, children, you know, as he said, I, I was sitting here just wondering, Lord, what you going to give me to say? He said, he, he, he kept shaking his, head, shaking his head at me. I ain't going to give you nothing to say. <laughs> I said, I've seen Elder Brown walk in like that. I said, now, Lord, I just begin to remember. <laughs> well, I was right in for it. Brother George Wright, how are you? Oh, good. Bless you, Brother Wright. Uh, Brother Lodge, he's back there. Oh, is that right? Brother Lodge Perry, he says back here. Where you at, Brother Lodge? I haven't seen him in a long oh, while. Well, now we ought to... Uh, have a real meeting here. <laughs> Lodge Perry, George Wright, some of them old timers that used to be here when they almost had to hold the shutters on the place with their hands, the wind on. Good seeing you. Mother, Sister Wright with you. Sister Wright in? Back there too. Yes, well, uh, Sister Perry, I see them all now. Well, that's really fine. Good to be in. Good to set these places. It's good to be together. I planned on so hard coming back Burden in the heart. Uh, I just returned from Africa, as you all know. And uh, when I got over there, I had a restricted visa and wouldn't let me, wouldn't let me preach. They're called together's too many together. They're expecting an uprise there at any time. And, and they, they wouldn't let me preach because of that gathering too many people together. And the only way I could was I'd have some organization that's represented by the government, in the government, to invite me over, then that would automatically let the government send out a militia for protection. See, there's just, there's just going to be an uprise, and that's the order is to it. It's just right in hand. He, that government man said the last time he was here, he had about a quarter of a million people together. And he said, and you see, I just be a very thing that communism is looking for for an uprise. So I couldn't preach. Those people stand there waving their hands and crying. Remember my mother, remember my brother, I, my, there and in behind a bar, you know, bars of wire, and it just makes you feel real bad. And I come back home, and I thought, well, my son Joseph back there had let down a little bit in his reading, and he had, uh, he passed all right, but he had to take it over, he wasn't reading good enough, so I thought, well, we're going to have to stay home a little while, and I said, if we stay home... It's going to ruin the kids' vacation, so we just postponed it and take him over to another part in August and let and come back here for a couple, three weeks. I said, I believe while we're back there, I'll just take and hold a meeting. We get that school auditorium up here, and, and we'll have a meeting from the 28th on through to the 1st, a meeting at the school auditorium. I want to preach on the subject of the outpouring of them seven last vials. And um, so we called ahead and... We had a little disappointment. They won't let us have these schools anymore. Too many people crowds in. We can't have it nowhere. And um, so then I decided while I was back here then, and instead of, we can't put all the people, if we'd ever, it's never been advertised now. So if we put all the people, try to put them in the tabernacle here, we couldn't do it, see. It just, five days in here would be awful. So sitting in there talking with Brother Neville and Brother Woods and them, we have decided to do this. If we can't, uh, uh, instead of that, make us have five services. That'd be 28th, 29th, 30th, 31st, and 1st. Well, I feel if we have, beginning next Sunday, we can have two services, Sunday morning, Sunday night, that's the 18th. 
And then on the on the twenty fifth have Sunday morning, Sunday night, that's four services. Then on August the first have a Sunday morning, Sunday night, I give us six services, and then it won't make this a jam to get the people in. And I uh, think that don't you think that'd be better than having everybody just crowded and mashed together and everything they uh, just that for them two services, we can put up with that, but uh, everybody kind of pulled together. Uh, for a five night street it would make it hard. And I I want to get with the trustees and the elders here while I'm here. This is becoming everywhere. We're living in these last days. That where the gospel does not have the, the premises that it should have, it don't have the rights that it should have. It's all sold up in politics and things. And it's just like a union, and that's what it's finally coming to. Because the mark of the beast has to come by union, we know. So we, we because it's a boycott, no man can buy or sell to save him and have the mark of the beast. And now, uh, I want to find out through the elders to feel led. I've never had such a hunger in my heart for God in all my life, and I have now. See? For, and I, I want to get my own tent. And my, myself, like uh, the Lord gave me a vision to it, I believe that the time is just now at hand. And I want to see while I'm here, while we can't get the tent, and... And then when we go, like, come here to Jeffersonville, see if I have just a day or two or three or four days, we can go out here and put up this tent and have two or three weeks. You see, if uh, nobody saying about it. We can either take a ballpark or if they won't let us have that, this farmer out here let us have a farm. We'll rent the farm. And, and but the only thing we just have to do there is be make our, our outbuildings and so forth and uh, for our conveniences. And that could be easily done. And then we start... Uh, having our services like that because that's according to a vision from the Lord. Amen. It's to be done that way. And coming in yesterday and finding, you know, this, that, and going up the street, and a good friend of mine going along there said, Hello, Billy. I looked at him, snow white hair, that much tummy, and the boy's my age. We run around, got a handsome young fellow. When I was a kid, uh, it kind of made me feel funny. My little son, Joseph, said, Why are you sad, Daddy? Oh, I said, I can't explain it to you, Joseph. See, I can't, can't tell you. And I look at Lige Perry sitting back there. Mrs. Perry, it seemed like yesterday there were a little black-headed couple out there living next door to me when we had the old boat Wahoo and down on the river and Fished at night, see them both white-headed. You know, it says one thing. It's a little buzzer that comes on. You ain't got much more time. <laughs> so, I want every day of my life to count for him. What I have left, what time I have, I want to spend it somewhere doing something that's no more standing on a street corner, testifying to the glory and honor of God. And, uh... I'm here for that purpose. And I've got a little secret place up here, Greensville, Indiana. It's not a city now, it's a, it's a wilderness. And some people take it over and they won't even let you set a foot on it. But I got a cave there that he'll never find he when I got into it. I go in at nighttime and he'll never want to go in and come out. And he don't know where the cave is and couldn't get to it and no matter where it was. And I want to go over and talk to the Lord a while. And I feel it is a necessity. My wife, she wants to come, we want to come back and visit around Rebecca and Sarah and them with their friends, and we're back here now for the next three weeks. And it's the Lord willing. And I think instead of trying to jam the people all together for them meeting here in the tabernacle, of course, this belongs to us, belongs to the Lord, give it to us, it's air conditioned. But I'd have a Sunday morning service, a Sunday night service that lets people go back to their place and wait over for the next coming week. I don't think I could take and, and officially do justice to the pouring out of those last vials, because they're very, very uh, great message in that, but I could pray for the sick and do things that uh, have messages to the, the Lord will give them to me, or the church through the week. I'll get out here in the wilderness somewhere and study, come back on Sunday morning, have a Sunday morning service like this, and a Sunday night service. Our most gracious little pastor, Brother Neville, I asked him if 
that would be satisfaction to him that's taken all his services away from him, but he was more than glad to surrender it to, to, uh, over to that. I just, Brother Cap, see, I guess got the Roman fever too, and I see he's left, and, and Brother Humes, and the Lord had a Brother Man here just to take right over, and the place, you know, isn't that wonderful how God will do things? He always has everything timed just right. I come up and I heard somebody preaching, I said, that don't, I believe Brother Cap, he come to Tucson, I think it bluffed him right quick, about 110 degrees. <laughs> He didn't want nothing to do with that. So away he went, him and Brother Humes, and went up to Phoenix. Of course, it's 115 to 16, 18 up there. That was still worse. I think he took off to Texas after that. He was trying to find a place. But you don't want no Arizona this time of year. I tell you. It's 140 the other day. Uh, last Friday, 140 degrees at Parker. And that's where Brother Craig the church here is. And you can break an egg and fry where it's the ground. <laughs> you, you spit it, it, the moisture's gone. It just, there's no humidity or nothing. It's really a bake of it this time of year. But from about November, December, January, wonderful. But when it comes about March, April, you, you better get away. <laughs> you don't want to suffocate. And uh, so uh, Brother Capstan had to come just at that time, which I think run him out. So maybe the Lord did that for a purpose. I'm believing this, that God orders the footsteps of the righteous. Amen. Sometimes it seems hard. Like the other day on this trip to Africa, I was so sure that I was moving in the will of God because a year ago I was down in the South holding a series of meetings and they, uh, they I thought coming from that organization said, you can come on to the Christian business, man, but we'll have nothing to do with it. Well, I don't want to throw them man right in on, you know, make conflict. I, I want to make them feel good at one another. So I just said, well, wrote him a letter. I said, remember, I've tried to get into Africa for years. Again, feeling that my ministry isn't finished in Africa. I have no, why would I have to go to Africa when I got... Six, seven hundred cities right here in the United States calling. See, just right here without leaving Canada and Mexico or any of those places. Why should it, well, I want to go there? But it's something in my heart that pulls me to Africa. There, those people, uh, they, there's something about them that I love. And uh, I want to go just for the colored people only. And there's something, and a lot of them leaders, they don't feel I should do that. I, I want to go to my current friends. That's where the Lord comes. And I, they're needy. Many of those people, those white people, can have doctors and everything. Them poor natives live out there in half rock. And I, I, I feel they're the ones that look like they're receiving. They're the ones that do something about it. When you get to a spot you're so smart that you know everything, then God can't do nothing with you. But if you get to a place that you're willing to listen and learn, then, then God's time to move in and talk to you. Amen. And so um, I wrote him a letter back and told him, I said, remember, at the day of the judgment, let them bony hands reach out of smoke, condemn you. Their blood be upon you, not on me. Because I've tried for about ten years to get back. Then when I mailed the letter, come back, something said to me, see Sidney Jackson take a hunting trip. At the same time the Lord spoke to City Jackson, said, Yellow Main Line, Brother Branham, Camping, Durban, big meeting. Well, he was over here. He spoke with you here. By the way, we baptized. He was firmly against this baptism in the name of Jesus Christ, and his wife was worse than he was. She would just walk away. You could, I'm telling you, I've never seen any more devout people. They've got about 150 ministers over there baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and they're just burning the country up. <laughs> the message is just sweeping Africa everywhere. Aviators and great men coming, being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And um, so I, when I started to go over, I'm telling you, I never had so much trouble in all my life for trying to get there. And then at the very last minute, very last minute to go, here's road across my visa cannot anticipate in any kind of religious service can only come honey well then <laughs> it was rank but I said I don't care what the devil does I, I can't I can't vouch for what brother Jackson said about yellow main line and this that and the other I, I can't vouch but I do know God told me to see Sidney Jackson and go hunt and I said I'm going and sometimes and I had one of the greatest trips I found out what the trouble was 
Now I think about October, the Lord willing, I go back to have a meeting and everything, full cooperation and everything else, see, in Africa. Now I got to the bottom of it and found out where it was then. What caused it? Up here, right, and this one's got this saying, something's got something saying, this and there. The best thing to do is go find out yourself. And I know where the trouble was and what the reason of it was. It was because of so many people gathering together, the government wouldn't let me have it. Now, if the Christian businessman or any organization which will bring us in, then the government automatically, because this uh, organization is represented with the government, the government sends militia protection. If there be 25 men out of one denomination, 25 out of another, still they won't receive that. It's got to be the, the head of this organization. And a Christian businessman is a non-sectarian uh, organization representing all the churches. Dr. Simon, their head over there, a very fine man, I got to meet him and talk with him, and they're taking the meetings and all the rest of the churches is coming in together, see? And I believe we'll have one of the greatest meetings that's been had yeah. in, in Africa. But my point was this, when you know that you're, you're trying to do what's right, the first thing is, if you feel led to do anything, then check it with the Word and see if it's right with the Word. And then let nothing stop you. Amen. I don't care how many wheels the devil throws in the way, just move right over the top of them. I told my wife, and I told Brother Woods when I got here, and some friends that I met yesterday, I have had about five years here that I hardly know what to do. It's been a, a nervous, uh, see, the revival itself amongst the churches it dies. Everyone knows that. You feel it in this tabernacle. You feel it everywhere. There is a thump. Dead feeling. There's just something isn't right. It's because the revival enthusiasm has gone away from the people. Going to the churches. You'll see them sitting there and, and a pastor stumbling around for a message and something or another and the first thing you know is turn it off on some type of party they're going to have or something. It seems to be a dead thumb everywhere. Big Graham notices it. Old Robert. Mr. Allen had some trouble, as you know. Old Robert got that $50 million uh, buildings and so forth in there. He's got a school. And, well, uh, nobody on the field now. Now, that's here by a vision to go yonder to Tucson to See what the Lord wanted me to do. There he met me up there as he told you here that he would do it. And the farm of seven angels and said to return back and the seven seals is to be opened. That's just exactly what happened. He said one day with Brother Woods when he came out there we went to the same place and threw up a rock. He come down he said within a day and night you're some, I forget just what the words was, you're going to see the glory of God. And the next day, a whirlwind came down out of the skies. And we know the story of what's taking place. When it went up, they asked what it was. I said, it spoke three words and three great blasts. The man only heard the blasting. I understood what it said. And it said, judgment striking west coast. Two days after that, Alaska liked to stump. Been thundering around, earthquakes, everything. Just look at them every day. Earthquakes is shaking everywhere. My last meeting, last meeting I had, just to be my first message, really, to preach that thing. I preached in Los Angeles at the Belfort Auditorium, and I was speaking on a man choosing himself a wife. You probably got the tape of it. it I said it reflects his character and his ambition. That when a man takes a woman, he takes a young girl, and to be his wife, he takes a, uh, you know, a modern uh, girl that's uh, common to Rick Edda. It, it just shows what he's, if he marries a beauty queen or a sex queen, whatever it is, it shows is what's really in the man. But a Christian, he looks for character in a woman. Because he's planning a future home with that woman. He plan he gets a homemaker. And I said, then Christ, 
according to his word here, tells us what our future home will be. What kind of wife will he choose then? A denominational prostitute? Never. He'll choose a woman that's characterized by his word. That'll be the bride. And while in there, something struck me. Now, I didn't know it until about 30 minutes that the prophecy went out. First thing I remember, Brother Mosley and Billy, I got on the street walking, and it said, Thou Capernaum, which calls yourself by the name of the angels, that's Los Angeles, city of angels, see, the angels, which are exalted into heaven, will be brought down into hell. For if the mighty works have been done in Sodom, it's been done in you, it would have been standing till this day. And that was all unconsciously to me. See? And how I just got to exalting Christ, exalting him, and telling the church, I said, you women, no matter how I try to come to you and preach against these things, that you men, you preachers, you constantly, come all the time, do it just the same. You walk over and hit the word of God wasn't nothing. And when I understood that, I went, I said, there's a scripture about that somewhere. And I went and found it was Jesus rebuking Capernaum by the sea coast. That night, I looked at the scriptures, come home, got the history book. And Sodom and Gomorrah was once the, a thriving city, a Gentile headquarters of the world. And you know that city by an earthquake sank into the Dead Sea. And Jesus stood and said, Capernaum, if Sodom had had the worst done in it that you've had done in you, it would have been standing today. But now, you must be brought down to hell. And about 200 or 300 years after his prophecy, with all them coastal towns, every one of them still standing, but Capernaum, and it lays in the bottom of the sea, an earthquake sunk it into the sea. And then prophesying, Los Angeles, would be in the bottom of the sea. And I come home and went to Africa, and while I was in Africa, they had an earthquake. And scientists, you see, it was on a broadcast that some big fine homes tumbled in in Los Angeles and a motel and so forth. And now, there is a, since that earthquake, there's a two or three inch crack that come in the earth, starting in Alaska, Goes around through the Aleutian Islands, comes out about 150 or 200 miles in the sea, comes back up at San Diego, takes in California or Los Angeles, and it comes out again just below um, uh, the northern part of California, there, a little place called uh, San Jose, just below there. And this scientist is speaking, being on an interview, was watching on television, and um, he said beneath that is just a churning lava. And he said, uh, they, he said, that, if a chunk will break loose. And I said, and it will, and this inter, now, uh, scientist interviewing this chief scientist said to him, said, well, uh, that could, then all think, he said, could, it's got to. He said, well, of course, we probably be many, many years from now. He said, it can be in five minutes from now. Or it can be in five years from now. He just lied five years. But just as I sure is there that inspiration, but judgment on that west coast, then follow it right up here with the sinking of Los Angeles, she's gone. Right? It will happen. Amen. And I don't know. But oh, what happened? You know, we only got six continents now. We had seven. That one is sunk between Africa and the United States, or uh, historical, you know about it. Now, if that goes down, then I want you to watch when this was a sermon that I preached on when I believe Brother Wright's Perry might have been deacon here in the church at that time for all I know. But it said the time will come. I didn't know it but Mrs. Simpson brought me the, the sermon the other day and it got wrote in a little book. That the desert, that the ocean shall weep its way into the desert. That was 30 years ago. And of course, the salt and sea is about 200 feet below sea level. And that big churning of earth swallowing in like that with hundreds of square miles, hundreds and hundreds of square miles, 
sinking into the earth, that'll throw a pot away from their husband. Sure it would. Oh, we're at the end time. Glorious hour. Amen. The appearing of the Lord Jesus says, There shall be earthquakes in diverse places. Perplex the time, distress between nations, man's heart failing in fear. That when these things begin to happen, raise up your head. The redemption is drawing nigh. Oh, my. Nations are breaking. Israel's awakening. The signs that the prophets foretold. The Gentile days numbered with horrors and cumbers. Return or disperse to your own. Be sure to do that. That day of redemption is near. Man's hearts are failing for fear. Be filled with God's Spirit. Have your lamps trimmed and clear. Look up. Your redemption is near. That's right. False prophets are lying. God's truth they're denying that Jesus the Christ is our God. See the picture the other day? Now I turn that picture sideways there and the very picture of those seven angels being lifted up. Turn it to the right hand side and there's the face of the Lord Jesus looking down to the earth again. Remember when I preached the seven church ages? I couldn't understand why Jesus standing there with a white uh, over his head. He's a young man. I took it back in the Bible. It said, He came to the Ancient of Days whose hair was white as wool. Jesus is only thirty-three and a half years old at his crucifixion. I called up Brother Jack Moore, a theologian. He said, Oh, Brother Branham, that's Jesus in his glorified state. He said, After his death, burial, and resurrection, he turned to that. That sounded all right for a theologian, but it didn't go good. It didn't hit the something. I went up there and started my first church age. There the Holy Spirit revealed it. I've got it right on your stretch ages. I guess the books will be out pretty soon now, the full detail of it. And it showed that Jesus was judge. There's a white wig that he used to wear to put a wig on and wear as a judge. England still does it. When you got supreme authority, and that turning sideways this picture, there he is, his black hair, he's sitting in the side of his beard and the white wig on. He is the last of the authority. He's supreme authority. Even God said to himself, This is my beloved son. Hear ye him. Amen. There he is with them angels, the message which was the seven breaking of them seven seals that revealed serpent seed and all these things here. And it shows that it is his very covering. It's his, it's his supreme authority. Amen. He is supreme. And his wigs are, are covered. The Bible said that he changed his countenance or he changed himself. Immortal. The word comes from the Greek word immortal, which means a Greek actor that plays many parts. Today he's one thing, the next act is something else. He was God the Father in one act, God the Son in another act, and God the Holy Ghost in his act. There he is, his word is still supreme. We're living in the last days. Coming back from Africa the other day, I Kind of college, it's just, it's nighttime there now, and you have to turn around that time, we got to turn around and come back again. We had a wonderful trip, hunting trip, one of the best I ever had in my life. Then, Billy's got some pictures, maybe you have a timing short somewhere and show you the trip. I had a dream. I'm always dreaming of being back at public service company somehow. So I, I thought I was kind of ratting on the job. I suppose they just let me have my own way. <laughs> I thought I'd, instead of going out and walking the lines or collecting the bills or something I was supposed to do, I just said, well, my own boss just went swimming. I got down there and took off my these clothes and put on my swimming clothes. I was by myself and I thought, say, this ain't right. The company, this is daytime. The company's paying me for this time. Oh, that's strange. And then I thought, well, the money I collected on the route, I had both the patrol and the route mixed together, and I said, well, the money I collected, I have done something walking around here, lost all the tickets. And I got their money and my money mixed together. Now, how do I know who paid the bill? I thought, just because it wasn't paying any attention. I thought, that's not right. There's only one thing for me to do. That's go back to my superintendent and tell him that was Don Willis. I said, Don, I lost those tickets. Now, here's all the money I got. Here's their money together. Leave it here at the cashier, and the people, when they come in, they'll have a receipt that I'll receive their bill. Probably people sitting right here, and I, I, I know there is, that I collected from them in, in the days, and, I, and I, I'd give a receipt. You know, it's only 10% if you let your bill run over, and maybe a dollar and a half, be 15 cents over. A lot of them people, we just like to get together and talk to them, that the bill is going to come talk to them. <laughs> get 15 cents, you know, just to sit down and talk for a while to collect your bill. So I got ranked, he just got so many bills, I couldn't collect them. 
Well, I thought that's the only way I could do it. And I woke up. The place where we live, Sister Larson, I don't think she's here. She's been very nice to us. She don't like me to say that, uh, but she's a very fine lady. We've been living in her room. She's got two apartments, small apartments together. We ran them both. And wife and I sleep over here in, in the other apartment where I kind of receive the people when I can. And uh, there's a couple of little twin beds in there. I woke up. She wasn't awake yet. And after a while, she woke up and I waved over at her. And she looked back and bad her eyes a few times. I said, did you sleep good? She said, nope. And I said, I had off a stream I was back at that public service company. And I said, what have I done? I remember as a little boy, or a young man, I walked all those lines in Salem, Indiana, I go in, buy a breakfast, maybe a bowl of oats, that hot sun and everything, and I just make you sick to eat breakfast. I turned 10 cents on my petty case. The superintendent come down and said, said, you know what they said in the, in the meeting? Who is that knothead that would turn in 10 cents for breakfast? said, you know, at least turn in 50 cents. Now, you know, 50 cents is big breakfast in them days. And I said, well, I don't eat that much. He said, well, the rest of them turns in 50 cents. You ought to turn in 50 cents. I said, well, I don't use it. He said, turn it in anyhow. That's what you pretended. Well, I thought, well, what can I do? I have charged 50 cents and I eat 10 cents. So I go out on the street and get some little kids that didn't have no breakfast and get them 40 cents worth of breakfast. So then I thought, well, what could I, maybe that's what he holds against me. And I remember here not long ago, to come through on the patrol, tore up that backyard back there and said, turn in your bill. You know, they got patrol right, but they have to pay for damage. I just wrote back and said, don't owe nothing. I thought that'll pay for them 40 cents. Maybe I spent 20 or 30 dollars during that time giving it to kids. Maybe that would have kept on dreaming. Then I had a big tree out there the kids played under it. And the patrol out and patrolled a helicopter. So he come in and said, Billy, how about cutting that tree out? I said, no, don't cut it. We're going to trim it. I said, Brother Woods and I go trim it. He said, well, I'll just have the man come by and trim it. I said, now, don't cut it. He said, I won't cut it. I went off on a trip when I come back, she's cut on the ground. Then I had a lawsuit come in, see. I said, well, Lord, this is clear. That's why I know. So I shook that off. That's all right. Just let it go. Well, I still dreamed it. When I got up the other morning, I said, well, the first thing we do in the morning when we get up is pray together. Then pray when we go to bed at night. And then, after she went on over to get the kitty's breakfast, I started to pray. I said, Lord, I must have been an awful guy. What have I done in life that I, I can't get away from that public service company? I went and took a bath, come back up. Something just seemed to say to me, maybe I'm ratting on his job. Oh, here's about five years, I ain't done nothing. Just waiting on him. Then up there the other day, this Bill us a new home up there. Brother Mosley come down and talking about it. I said, that's just a little gift from my father. He started crying. I said, you see, he said, if you leave your home, houses, Land, fathers, mothers, I'll give you houses, land, fathers, mothers, and hundredfold in this life and eternal life to come. I said, see, I had to leave the tabernacle that I love so dear. My home that the Lord gave me up there, had to leave it. He just gave me this one back. I said, he's wonderful. And he started crying. Well, uh, I said, I had to come out here and separate myself, come to this desert, and I thought, where why God bring me to a desert? Out here where there's nothing but scorpions and needle monsters. And it's not only a desert, it's a hot, but it's spiritually a desert. Oh my, there's no spiritual life at all. In churches are gifts. Well, you ever seen such in your life? We don't even have a church to go to or nothing. And then, when uh, the people almost perish spiritually, I noticed in the people that come out there, see the differences in them, watching them. And so, you stay out of the Spirit of God, your life becomes sweet, tender, like water brings this grass and soft bud. If this grass in Arizona wouldn't grow, these trees would be cactus. And leaves just wind up and make stickery. That's the way it is when you get dry around the church, everybody's sticking one another, you know. You got to have soft waters of rain soften you up, make leaves and shade for the pilgrim that passes by. So, something said to me, maybe you're ratting on God's job. So I prayed for a vision. The media just got me a new Bible, and Brother uh, brother Brown from up in Ohio got me a new Bible. Both of them at the same time at Christmas. I went and got one of the new Bibles. I said, Lord, in the days go by, you had a year of my son. Now listen, let me say this, of course, they're not... This is not taping. This meeting is not past standing. Let me say this. 
Don't do this. That's a good thing. But I said, Lord, used to be when a dreamer dreamed a dream, that they took it down to the Urim of Thundam and told it, and if the, if the Urim of Thundam flashed the lights back, a supernatural light, the dream was true. I said, but that priesthood and that Urim of Thundam is done away with. Your Bible is the Urim of Thundam now. Lord, may I never do this again. I ask you and pray to you to give me a vision. Speak to me about why am I dreaming these dreams? What have I done if I've harmed, if I've done anything to any person in the world? Let me know. I'll, I'll, I'll go make it right. If I owe the public service company, if I've done something wrong to them or any other person, if I've done something wrong to you, let me know. I, I want to make it right. Let's make it right now. Don't wait till it's wrong. Maybe too late. Let's do it now. And I said, surely there's something in this Word of God from Genesis to Revelation that some character in there that you dealt with would be on the same basis. That would be my question. If somebody done something and, and you... Got to ask him about it. Then let me turn to that place in the Bible. And if somebody, whatever they've done, it'll lean my way. What I've done wrong or something you want me to do or haven't done, let me see some character in the Bible I can close my eyes. Just let the Bible fall open, put my finger on the scripture. In Genesis 24, 7. Eliezer, Abraham's faithful servant, the model servant of the Bible, being sent to hunt the bride for Isaac. Chills run over me. Sure, that's, my, that's right with the rest of my message. Pulling out the bride, he said, Swear that you will not take a bride out of thee. But go to my own people. He said, What if the woman won't come with me? He said, Then you're free of this little. He said, And the God of heaven will send his angel before you to direct you. He went right straight out and began praying, and he met the beautiful Rebecca. That become the bride of Isaac. Just a perfect message back to the Word. Go get that bride. That's a duty. That's what I'm here for. That's what I'm trying to do is call out a bride. Remember California there, that interview of the bride preview I had here? How that bride come up first and see her go by? Then here come Miss America, Miss Asia, and all the offers of name. And the same bride passed by again. One of them got out of uh, getting her back in step. Two of them it was. That's what I was supposed to do. Keep that pride in step. Hunt that man. I said, God, I'm going back home. Renew my vows again and start out anew. So that's what we're planning on doing. That's what I'm here for. I think it'd be a good thing if we did this, started on the 18th, next week, next Sunday morning, next Sunday night, the following Sunday, and the following Sunday. How many think that'd be a good thing? Uh, thank you. Now I want you to do something for me. If you've notified any people that there's going to be a meeting on the 28th. Will you re-notify them again that we couldn't do it? Tell, write them a letter or something that we don't want the people to come and be disappointed. But we could not get the auditorium. We couldn't get it. And so, uh, uh, the calls, the last meeting, I think we had so many up there and everything, they just, you know how the public is. And they're, well, we're just living in the last days, that's all. And um, they claim that the people come in and disturb the school and they were there too early and they did this or that or something and the place is too jammed up and the bar marshal does this and that and, well, um, you know. So, we will set up those files and those trumpets. I want to place them in. I told you it would. They come under another thing. So does the files come under sounding the trumpets. But we want to take that entire course right straight through and bring it tied in together. How many has read any of Brother Veil on rewriting that and fixing it up and grammarizing it for me? Have you read any of it? Uh, yeah, two or three of it. I think you've done a real job, Brother Veil. Real job. You, I think Sister Veil did it. You just uh, wrote it. See, uh, she was a... See, I'm not always against the women, am I, Sister Veil? <laughs> so now, let us, for the next 15, 20 minutes, read a scripture here. I, and uh, i got a little book here. I told I believe it was this Brother Vail or who was it? Uh, I believe it's Roy Borders. Brother Vail bought me the book. I want to make a little textbook. But if anybody ever looked at what I call notes, I can want to preach about the morning star, I'll draw a star. And if I want to preach something else, I make it all in symbols here, scratches. Nobody can ever know what it was. But I'm out and I think of anything I got a, on a ride on the road. Sometimes the car is jumping up and down. And I'll jump this down and say this and that and make little signs and crossing bridges and 
and uh, all kinds of things like uh, I want to preach on the descending of the star and I'll put the pyramid right out here put the five point star David coming down on it and I don't want to go into the scriptures like that and Moses certain thing he done just make little turkey tracks like I got several of them in here and I thought uh, this morning back there when I thought I'd speak on this subject for a few minutes here on uh, a note maybe take me 20 minutes and then I ain't going to take Brother Neville's service tonight. <laughs> I, uh, I'm going to rest tonight, listen to him, and then the Lord willing, next Sunday morning, we'll start the service. And y'all help me, and we'll pray. Because it's in my heart to try. They said, well, we could go to Louisville, or we could go down to New Albany. But the meeting was supposed to be for Jeffersonville. I'll go to Louisville and New Albany at different times, but this is supposed to be here at Jeffersonville. Now let's bow our heads just a minute while we've been... I've been talking to you here for about 30 minutes. Let's speak to him a moment. Lord Jesus, we are, we are certainly a blessed people above our thinking, above our understanding. Or if there was a noble among us, uh, such as uh, some uh, personnel from some other country or diplomat of some sort, we think it was great to have such a noble person among us. But today, we have the God of heaven, not only among us, but in us, dwelling, living his life through us. And we're so thankful for this, Lord. It's beyond our understanding, of course. But now, speaking on what the services and going to Africa and the things that we've tried to arrange for these few days here in the Indiana, and somehow or another, Lord, maybe you're driving us to that tent to make that vision fulfilled. So, thy will be done. We've committed this way the best of our understanding, so we pray, Lord, if there's anything contrary to your will, you'll make it known to us, that we might know to do your perfect will. God bless us. In these next few minutes, speak to us through thy word, Lord, for thy word is truth. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn in the Bible to Mark Day, chapter 10. Now, I'll, I'll, just a little short message here. I speak to you about the Word that you're testifying about over there and so forth. Mark, the 8th chapter, and let's begin about the 34th verse to the 30th, taking the 30th rest of that chapter. I like to read what he says, because I know that's true. Now we, and when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man? If he gains the whole world and loses his own soul, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. I want to take a little text from there, it would be called that, called ashamed. You know, I like that. Whosoever is ashamed of me and of my words, I'll be ashamed of him. Now, the word ashamed could be also translated embarrassed. You know, something that you're uh, you're faced with something that you're embarrassed about. Being ashamed. And, uh, another thing, being ashamed does show that you are not sure of what you're talking about. If you know what you're talking about, and have the assurance that you know what you're talking about, you can tell anybody that. You're not ashamed. But if you feel put out, out of place, it shows you're not sure. You know, there's, there's so much of that today, especially on the subject that I'm speaking of, ashamed of the Word. Now, He and the Word are the same. 
In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The same yesterday, today, and forever. So whosoever is ashamed of me and my words, and he and his word are one, so being ashamed of his word. In this sinful present generation, I'll be ashamed of him. Now, we notice today, if somebody says, uh, uh, are you a Christian? It's very much a popular thing. They, oh, I'm a Christian. But do you believe the word of God? Word says, these signs shall follow them who believe it. Oh, even the minister's face is a blush. Are you ashamed of, say, of divine healing? Are you ashamed of the full gospel? Are you ashamed of your Pentecostal experience? That's being ashamed of his word. That's his word made flesh in you. So his word has to live itself out for every generation. It lived and set out in the days of Moses. Because in that day, the Bible says in Hebrews, first chapter, God in sundry times and diverse matters spake to the fathers by the prophets. And those prophets, the church got all so twisted up that when those prophets, those daring messengers of God come without church, without denomination, without organization, without anything, the five kings, kingdoms, churches, and everything. When the priest was brought before, they was brought before the priest, they wasn't ashamed because they had directly thus saith the law. If you notice, the prophet, in one sense of the word in the Old Testament, when he said, Thus saith the Lord, now watch him, he goes right into the phrase of taking the place of God. You notice, when he placed out before him, Thus saith the Lord, he fell right into God. And he acted as God. Then he gave his message, which was God speaking to him. Thus saith the Lord. I think of the prophets of old when they come with that message. And it embarrassed the king. And it uh, made the people feel uncomfortable, the priests even. They would feel uncomfortable because they were supposed to be leaders, religious men. And when the the word came forth in that manner, it exposed them. And they felt embarrassed or ashamed. And many times we see that, not many, too often today. That man, you say, I am a Christian. Have you received the Holy Ghost that you believed? Oh, uh, see, they're embarrassed about it. Somebody said, do you belong to that group up there that does all that there, shouting and all that divine healing stuff? Many times Christians back up. They want to announce that if they got a denomination, I'm Baptist, I'm Presbyterian, I'm Luther. They're not ashamed of that. But when it comes to being a Christian that can take God's word just the way it is, then they're, they're, they're ashamed. I don't belong to any denomination. They're, they're, they're ashamed to say that. They've got to be like the rest of the world, represented by some organization. Now that's just recently come into that. In the days of Luther, to recognize yourself as a Luther and a follower of Luther, well, it almost meant death by the Catholic Church. In the days of Wesley, to know that you had defied the Anglican church, it was almost a penalty of death for the Anglicans to announce that you were a Methodist. In the days of Pentecost, it was a shame almost to say that, that, you, was, uh, that you was a Pentecostal because you was quickly counted a holy order or, or some tongue speaker or something like that. Now they organized, went right in with the rest of the group. Now when the calling out time comes, that you don't belong to any of us. Very popular Sam Pentecost. Very popular Sam Pentecost Luther. But what comes to the time that you have to come out and stand for the word? I don't belong to any of us. That, that uh, embarrassed. Jesus said, now if you're ashamed of me, then I'll be ashamed of you. Why would he be ashamed of you? Because you're claiming to be his when you won't follow him. What if I said to uh, uh, this little boy, he's, he's my son. He turned out and said, Who? Maybe your son? What do you think I am? 
It would embarrass me, wouldn't you, your son? And that's the way that so-called Christianity today, if you name it a name of a denomination, all right. They accept the fatherhood of a denomination, but when it comes to accepting the fatherhood of the Word of God, Christ, no, they embarrass. They don't want to say, yes, I have spoken from them. Yes, I have seen this. Yes, I believe in divine healing. Yes, I praise the Lord. I'm free from all organization. I'm not bound down to any of that. I'm a servant of Christ. Oh, my. That just tear him to pieces. The other night, a great speaker coming amongst the full gospel businessman in Chicago. May I stop here just a minute to say this? You excuse me? But many times you think, and I do too, that what we're talking about, the truth of the Bible, don't go over amongst the people. But it does. Sometimes they'll rail right up against it, but they really don't mean it. They're trying to find where you're standing. As the story was about a bunch of drunks arguing that there was no such thing as Christianity. One man said, I know where there's one at, that's my wife. Said, well, I don't believe it. Said, come on with it. Let's all act like we're really drunk. Went up there at the house and done everything they could and, and he told them to cook them some eggs and then he threw them out on the floor and said, you know better to cook my eggs like that. Carrying on in the house and Went over in the other room, fell down a chair. They heard somebody out there sweeping it up, not saying a word, saying, sang a little song to herself. But Jesus bear the cross alone, and all the world go free. There's a cross for everyone, and there's a cross for me, and this consecrated cross out there till death shall set me free, and then go home a crown to wear. The world goes to want to tell you that she's a Christian. See, there's only trying her. And sometimes the world, our family, will try you. So, I never thought this would happen. But last Saturday night, I believe it was, or Sunday night, the great speaker, I don't know, subject to call people's names, but he's trying, working exactly contrary. I'm trying to keep that church out of that ecumenical move. And this man's trying to put him in there. So he's speaking for the Christian businessman, which I supposed to have had the meeting in Chicago, and I thought of being in Africa at that time, so I couldn't take it. This man said, got up there and said, the greatest move, the greatest thing that the earth now has ever been. All the churches are returning back to the Catholic Church to the ecumenical move, and the Catholics will receive the Holy Ghost. What a trap of the devil. Amen. And this leader, Brother Shakarian, uh, president of the international businessman, stood up and said, after the man sat down and said, that's not the way we've heard it. The Brother Bram has told us that this ecumenical move will move them all to the mark of the beast. And the man sat on a platform. That it will move it to the mark of the beast. And said, we're inclined to believe what he says is the truth. Amen. Amen. So are we. He said, how many of you would like to hear Brother Bram come and give you the true side of it? Raise it. And it's 5,000 something people. They screamed and cried. This has come for one day. One day. Brother Carl Williams called me up and said, Brother Bram... Well, I went out through that crowd so they had piles of hundred dollar bills laying in my hands to get your airplane ticket up here and back. See? Just for one day. See, those people, that word is sinking in where sometimes we don't know it. Yeah. See? But see, when you're really, no matter how much the world is against it, how much the denominations are against it, God's proven it to be the truth. Amen. The great hour finally strikes. Think like that maybe we didn't think about it. Yes, it shows you're not sure if you're embarrassed. So you would rather uh, not discuss the subject. If you're going to be ashamed of it, you wouldn't want to discuss it. Hold back. But how can a man who's filled with the Holy Ghost, how can a man full of the power of God, the love of God in his heart, talk to a man a few minutes and not mention something about that love that's in his heart? There's something that it, it happens. You can't do it. This is a, must be that evil day that Jesus is speaking of. People are ashamed of the Word and of the Spirit of God that acts within them. But when the truth is made plain to the people, God then Himself revealing Himself through the Word. Now, any man can make any kind of claims, and we've had it in these days where there's been so many claims, claims that it's been horrible. But you see, if there is... A truth, it must be by the Word. Because 
They say they had all kinds of things of oil pouring through people and blood out of their hands and women on their backs and with blood and running down their shoes and raise up their shoes and pour oil out and frogs jumping out and hopping down the platform and all kinds of things like that. There's no such stuff as that in the Bible. There's no promise of anything like that in the Bible. Only it said in the last days the Spirit would be so close to deceive the elect if possible. But there's no scripture for that. But when it comes to genuine and unadulterated Word of God confirmed by God, it seems to even embarrass the other group on the radical side. There's an embarrassment about it. But it's a reality to a man or woman, boy or girl, who really is a genuine Christian. When God made a promise of the baptism of the Holy Ghost and you receive it, there's something that settles within you that there's nothing takes its place. When a man ever meets God, not in some emotional workup, some enthusiasm or some religious doctrine, some catechism or creed or dogma, that he has accepted for a, a comfort for himself, but when he really comes to the place like Moses did, on the back side of the desert, walk up face to face with Almighty God. Amen. And you see the boy speaking to you exactly with the word and the promise of the hour. There's something it does. You're not ashamed of it. It does something to you. Now, let us look now for just the next 15 minutes. There's some people that receive such an experience. And as I speak to you today, not as a church or as a denomination, I speak to you as an individual. Amen. Not because you come here to this tabernacle. Because that I love you and you love me. Not because of that. Let me speak to you as a dying mortal. Yeah. That someday you've got to come to the end of this life. Amen. And I will not be there. And the other preacher might not be there. But there's only one who can meet you there, and that's God. Amen. And you, you listen to it, and not whether my wife is a good Christian, or, or my husband's a good Christian, but am I all right with God? Have I met God like that? Amen. Not because my pastor met God, or of course my deacon met God, but have I met Him? Not because I shouted, not because I spoke in tongues, but because I met Him as a person. Amen. Amen. Then you'll never be ashamed of that. Just something that's so perfect and pure and true. And remember, you might meet a spirit that would act like God. You might meet a spirit that would do this, that, and the other. Follow it a little bit and see how it compares with the Word of God. You might meet a spirit that would tell you you're saved and give you the glorious feeling in your shop and scream there when it comes to denying the Word. Tell, tell the Holy Spirit and hope the Word that is a Word. That spirit was punctuated with the promise of God within your man. If it isn't, then you never met God. You met a deceiving spirit. And the world's full of it today. But when you see God come down and make a statement that he's going to do a certain thing and comes back and does that time after time after time, then you've got a genuine spirit. Amen. Amen. How could a spirit be on a man? The Holy Spirit that wrote the Bible and turned around and now that's not right. That was for some other day. He said the promise isn't to you and to your children to them it's for all. Even as many as the Lord God shall call. That was Acts 2.38. How can a spirit that accepts anything different from that and be of God? When Hebrews 13 eight said Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and forever. Well, if somebody said, oh, he was a philosopher, he was a good man, he was a prophet. But his power is his power. I was speaking the other night. George Smith, the boy that goes with my daughter, Rebecca. Fine kid. Staying in the tabernacle. Baptist boy. It's just, I told him, take my name off of that thing. I want nothing to do with it. And there's a young lady that's having a conference at a certain Baptist church up in the hills, and, and they're so firmly against me, all of them out there. And about the, not, they're not got nothing against me, it's against this word. 
He is the man they can't say against me. I've never done him any harm. But that's what they're afraid of. Amen. Now, we were, they had this meeting up there, rather, and they had to go to have a missionary to take the last three nights of this great conference up in the hills where it's cool. That being this missionary got up and come on to March 16. And he said, there's many people today who can't believe in divine healing. He said, I was in India. I'm an Indian. And I was in India. When a man here in the United States, the name of Brother Brown, come. <laughs> All right, the pastor began to move over. He said, my wife was dying with cancer. Glory. I was blind or something like that. He prayed. The one of us, he had any call out the audience, not even knowing her own language. He spoke the power of God and said, we're here healed. Oh, well, they tried to shut up. They couldn't do it. No. That's our seat. Right in their own conference. And they even denied of anything. And some of the people, even my, uh, this boy's sister, that other down, wouldn't even have enough to say. They wouldn't know if she wasn't connected. Somebody they could get down to find out. One of the ladies said, well, I believe it. Rebecca and George went to see this lady. She went and got a girl. That was suffering with a, a kind of retarded a little. So they had me come over there to see the girl the other night. I went over there, the little lady sitting there, and I said, Are you a believer? She said, No, I don't know where I Well, she wasn't retarded, just a devil spirit. They don't realize it. See, it takes you, and you don't know it. It comes in, violence overcomes the person, and they don't know it. Wait a minute, we're all standing on the street with these shorts on. They don't realize. They might be, they can might be prove and swear to it that they've never uh, done anything evil against their husband or so forth like that. But in their heart, they don't realize, but the spirit of the devil has took them over. They are possessed that what would a woman want to strip her toes out off before a man? There's only one person done in the Bible. They were insane. Others try to cover themselves. They don't realize it's so cunning, so subtle. You have to watch, weigh yourself with the Word of God and see where you're standing. This young lady said, oh, they told me that I was baptized when I was a kid. I said, I don't know whether to believe that stuff or not. I said, don't you believe Jesus Christ? And she said, well, I don't know whether to do it or not. She said, some of that hocus pocus stuff, I don't believe it. I said, well, of course you don't believe hocus pocus stuff. I said, but do you believe that he was the Son of God? Of course that he could have been. I said, and I said, do you believe he's the same today, the God that would save you? She said, is any other stuff about that there? Oh, miracles and stuff like that, I don't believe nothing about. And I said, uh, what would you do if you were sitting in a meeting and seeing God, the Holy Spirit, which is the only God there is, Working amongst the people, God in the fatherhood, the pillar of fire, the prophet, God in his son, and God in his people. It's just attributes of God. The one great God covers eternity. I said, what would you see if he, among his people, uh, made the, the blind to see, the deaf to hear, look out upon the audience and tell the people what was wrong with them, and like he did when he showed her, she said, I'll be with the horoscope. I said, you are in a worse shape than I thought you were. You'd be better off if you was crazy. See? You wouldn't be accountable. But I said, you're just possessed of an evil spirit. I said, when well, Jesus told the woman at the well about her husband, when he looked upon the people and Perceive their thoughts. Would you call that horoscope? See, just so wrapped up in a denomination called Luther that anything contrary to that would be wrong. Now, God wants man who's wrapped up in the Word. <laughs> anything contrary to that's wrong. Jesus said, that every man would be a lie and mind be the truth. There was a man of a very scientific age by the name of Noah. He wasn't ashamed of God's word. God met him. He talked to him. He knew it was God. And he said, it's going to rain. It never had rain. 
But he believed it was going to rain. And the faith that he had, he wasn't ashamed to exercise it. He took 120 years to build a life when the world was against him. He wasn't ashamed of God's word. In his name, God saved him and his household for it. There was a, a how foolish it might have seemed to be to other people. But to him, he met God. No matter how scientific the other was, it was contrary, how it said it couldn't happen, it couldn't happen, he met God. Amen. That's what it is. When you know that you're talking to him, you think it was a foolish thing. When somebody, when I know that there's a few people in the world, holds on to what I say to be the truth. <laughs> to stand here and say, God said the Lord, I'm going to Arizona. Then I'll meet ten angels in a cluster. Well, there was a group of men standing there to see it happen. The other night, staying at Los Angeles would fall into the ocean. But when you have met God, and the God who doesn't fail, the God who does exactly what he said he would do, he's always done it. You're not ashamed of it, then. You don't have to walk back and be embarrassed about it. You tell the whole world. A man meets God, talks to him, and the reality of God becomes his in his heart. He's not ashamed of it. Noah was ashamed. It seemed foolish to the rest of the world, but not to him. Moses, when he's before Pharaoh, he wasn't ashamed to tell Pharaoh that these certain things would happen because he had met God. God told him in the burning bush. Yeah. Moses said, I, I stutter. That's what he had in his petty minute speech. He said, That's what Dan, you be God to him and you'll be prophet to you. I know he can speak well. But I'll be with your mouth. Who made man to speak? Hey, man, all that said, that's God. Who made man to be deaf or dumb or who made man to speak? God has. He said, Lord, show me your glory. He said, What's that your hand? He says, It's a stick that's torn over the ground. To turn to a servant and say, Take it up again and turn back to the state. Yeah. And he said, God, put your hand in your bosom. Put it in, pull it out, wipe the leper, says, and put it back and pull it again. And it was back to the other hand. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. Then he walk up before Pharaoh and say, What he said he'd say. He said, It's going to be thus and thus. Picked up sand and threw it up the air and said, Thus saith the Lord, let please come upon the earth. And then he came. Up water poured out into the river and said, Thus saith the Lord, and the whole rivers and everything turned to blood. Yeah. Oh, hail out of heaven! You know the last days are supposed to be them plagues repeat again? Yeah. You remember an adulterer in the Bible time, his penalty was death by stoning. Yeah. The unbelieving church will be stoned there. Well, hailstones is once God's way of punishment. He'll stone this unbelieving world as a dangerous generation. He'll stone it for heaven with hailstones weighing a pound of which is a hundred pounds. The dangerous church will die. Dangerous world will die under the punishment of God under stone, and like He did in the beginning. Get right with God, church. That's what we always do. Turn back to God. Yeah. That old fuzzy face, gray hair, whiskers, bald headed, skinny arm, 80 year old Elijah. Say you better order to sing like one of the sins of the people. God spoke to him over when he said, Go down there and tell me that. That's not even a jewel for heaven do you call for I can see his little eyes looking out from under that fuzzy looking white beard that's sticking his hand walking down the road like a 16 year old boy. Walked right up in the presence of the king and said, Not even two will come from heaven to our call for it. He wasn't ashamed of God or his word. Tell a king or anybody else. He wasn't ashamed and had to hide that. Hey, have you give me a. You're a person of mine or something like this. Tell me, I said to the people, I'm getting to a spot. I need more faith. On par now, I get a new burst of faith. Yeah. Got so old, it looked like when you pray for people, you apologize. Mr. Devil, would you please move over? Let me. Nothing. Faith got more.
heart goes to hell on its chest. Amen. When it speaks, everything else shuts up. Amen. Don't believe Mr. Devil, you move on. Get out of here, Ron. Yes. I don't got commission of God. Amen. Leave him alone. That moves. Did I have no apology to the devil? Nothing to do with him? No. Not ashamed of the word of God. Not ashamed of the commission. Not ashamed of who we are. Always ashamed that I am as I'm a brand. I'm saying to my failures. For like this, sir, I'm not ashamed. Amen. I'm not ashamed of his word. Or denominations, change politics, whatever it might be. It's ready to give an answer. God calls for Moses walked up before Pharaoh. He wasn't ashamed to tell him that they would not compromise. And take his so many days out of order. He said, some of the women stayed back in the church and said, we'll all we'll go. Not even one house will be left behind. We'll take our cattle and all. He wasn't ashamed. Why? He had come into the light of deliverance. That's the reason a man or a woman sick or anything once comes into the presence of God and knows that God's healed them. You're stepping into the light of deliverance. Don't compromise on anything. Deliverance is in his heart. For he met the God who said, I am the God of Abraham. Who gives Abraham the promise in the time of redemption of deliverance is at hand. I'm sending you down there to take him out. What's the apologize about that? Pharaoh could have killed him. He's just a man. He was a slave. He could have killed him. But he wasn't ashamed of the word. He didn't come down and get on his knees and beg to Pharaoh for nothing. He said, I'll come to take him. Pharaoh said, well, you can't take him. He said, all right. Then there'll be fleas up on the earth till you'll wait through him. That's what happened. So Moses, take him away. But all right, now you repent. He said, well, you can go so many days in the wilderness. He said, then flies will come. Amen. That darkness will come. It's so dark they couldn't see one from the face of the other. Why is death come? From Pharaoh to the servant, it was death for the oldest child in the family. He didn't have no apology to nobody. He was a son of Abraham, born in the Spirit of God, given commission by God, the message of God, to go down and take those people out. Well, okay. God called the same thing in this hour to take out the church of God. Amen. 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 Daniel wasn't a, or David rather, wasn't afraid before Saul. But everybody was afraid of Goliath out there. He wasn't afraid to walk up and say, Your servant, little funny looking fellow, said, Your servant was hurting his father's sheep. And a bear coming to God with him. I chased him out of the wilderness and killed him with this slingshot. A lion coming. Oh, my. A lion. Coming and got one of the round of words and I knocked him down with a slingshot when he got up. I killed him. He said, it is God. That backslidden king said there. And wishy-washy soldiers. Praying to serve the God of heaven and let that uncircumcised Philistine stand out there and defy the armies of the living God. That your servant also will slay him. For the God who delivered the lion and the bear to me will also deliver that uncircumcised Philistine. He didn't stutter. He didn't say, perhaps it'll be done. He said, it'll be done. He wasn't ashamed. Daniel, before the king, wasn't afraid to defy his orders. And nobody would pray only to him. He opened up the windows and threw up the sash and prayed three times a day. He wasn't afraid. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego wasn't to pay that for it first. No. Amen. There are the God able to deliver us. God can deliver us. But if he don't, we're not bound down to your image. No. They wasn't ashamed of it. No, sir. No, sir. They certainly wasn't ashamed of it. Because they knew. Samson wasn't ashamed before the blessings. When a thousand out of two, they picked up the jawbone of the mule. And that helmet, about an inch and a half thick of bread. He beat a thousand down with it and still had the jaw holding in his hand. He wasn't embarrassed. He just picked up what was in his hands and went to work with it. He knew that the Spirit of God was upon him. He knew he was born in Nazareth. He knew that nothing could bother him. 
He was the servant of God as long as he's in us. Will of God, nothing could stand in his way. No matter how many kings or Philistines or whatever more come up. Right? John was ashamed of the word of God that came to him in the wilderness and told him to go baptize the water. He was ashamed to say, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. For the Spirit of God was upon him. He wasn't ashamed before the priest. He wasn't ashamed of the word of God when he walked up to Herod. Philip's wife was living with Herod. Walked right up in the face of the king, this old woolly face, fell out of the wilderness there, come out of no education or nothing else, walked right up in the face of Herod and said, it's not lawful for you to have her. He wasn't ashamed of God's word. Sure. Absolutely was not ashamed of it. Stephen's he wasn't ashamed of God's word. First, the Pentecostal people. They were on the day of Pentecost when they got into the upper room. The Holy Ghost fell upon them by the promise of God. Luke 24, 49 said, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but wait in the city of Jerusalem until you receive power from on high. And the very promise that the word of God promised him. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but wait there. Don't get no more theology or educations and so forth. Wait till you're endued with power. And when that power from heaven came like a rushing mighty wind, they weren't ashamed of the gospel. Peter stood up and said, Get out one of you, man, with we can hand you crucified the Prince of Peace, which God has raised from the dead. And we're a witness. For this is what Joel said would come to pass the last days. I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. They weren't ashamed of the gospel. Little Stevens, as I mentioned him a few minutes ago, when he went through there like a, oh, a tornado. He wasn't a preacher, he was just a deacon. But he testified everywhere of the resurrection. He admit God. And it's just like, try to stop him? It's like trying to put a, a house, a burning house, a bar out of it. Or a windy day in a dry time. Why, every time the wind blew, it just set another fire. They jerked him up before the Sanhedrin Council. Can you realize what that is? That's it, like the Ecumenical Council. All religions head up there on the Ecumenical Council. All of them head up there on the Sanhedrin Council. Pharisees, Sadducees, Arabians, whatever they were, they had to come into that council. And they snatched him up, just not one organization, but the big council snatched him up. We'll scare the liver out of him. When he walked up that morning, the Bible said his face looked like an angel. All right. <laughs> he said, Mary, brother, let me speak to you. Our father's dwelt in Macedonia before they came to charge, so forth. He'd go and get the scriptures, and when he got all wound up, the spirit came up on him. He said, you stiff that doesn't circumcise the heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Ghost like your fathers did. Are you? Are you ashamed of the gospel? I was ashamed of the word. He wasn't embarrassed before he said, Hey, counsel. No. Paul said, Before Agrippa, being a Jew, called out of Gamaliel, a great dignitary he was. But one day on the road down to Damascus, he came in presence, contact with God. An angel came down from heaven in the form of a pillar of fire of light and struck him on the ground. Raised him and said, Lord, who are you? And he said, I'm Jesus. Stand before Agrippa, he repeated the story again. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it's the power of God and salvation to everyone that believes. Sure. Now, friends, we come on down with man down through the age, but we're past time. Let me say this. A man who has once come in contact with God, which is the Word. And the word has been made plain and manifested to him. There's no shame that's about that. You're not embarrassed. Doesn't embarrass me to say I believe every word of God. Doesn't embarrass me when the Lord says to say anything, you go say it and do it. Don't embarrass me to say that I've been filled with the Holy Ghost. Don't embarrass me to say that I've spoken with other tongues. Don't embarrass me to say that our Lord has shown me visions. Don't embarrass me to say he's the same yesterday and forever. When you're brought before rulers and kings for my name's sake, take no thought what you shall say. For it will be given to you in that hour. It's not you that speaketh, but my Father that dwelleth in you. 
But whosoever is ashamed of me and my word in this generation, him will I be ashamed of before my Father and the Holy Angel. God help us not to be ashamed. No. But help us to be living testimony. Amen. Amen. Yes. Every man. The Old Testament when the prophets came, they become they become the living word. They were the word. Jesus said they were called gods and they were. Because the word of God came to them, they said, Thus saith the Lord. And any disciple of Christ who has come in contact with him in redemption and salvation has come into his heart. He is a possessor of God. And what kind of life should we live and how should we walk and how should we talk? If God is representing himself in our own mortal body, who could be ashamed of that? I come to a place that I was on the police force here in Jeffersonville. Walk down the street and all the authorities. I wouldn't be ashamed of the city. I'd be part of the city. I'd be a police. A part of the city to keep order and conduct. If a man around his life, I wouldn't be ashamed of telling you that wrong. You give him a ticket. That's my duty. Because I'm, I'm getting paid by the city. I'm living by the city. I have the authority from the city. No matter if he's drunk or what's my name, let him back me up. I stand my ground because I'm a policeman and or, I'm ordained to put in here and give an authority to do this. You're supposed to take law and rights and things and to see this done right. And if I'm a Christian, and then fill with the Spirit, bring the testimony of Jesus Christ's resurrection. That he's the same yesterday. Don't let any of them try to push you around. Say you don't do this, you don't do that. You do do it. God, right, give you the See, we don't have power. That policeman don't have power to stop one car. It's about sometimes a three or four hundred horsepower motor. What could he do about it? But he's got authority. That's the church we have authority by the resurrection of Jesus Christ and his power for it. Amen. Hallelujah. The things that I do shall you do also. More than this will you do before I go unto the Father. Don't be ashamed of him in this generation. Sinful, perplexed, the last generation will ever be on the earth. It's sinful of drunkenness and full of all putrefied sores. All, everything has been decent has become indecent. National politics uh, built. Nations are broke up. Way back in the jungles of Africa. Oh. Safari hunters. They had to take high power radios to hear Elvis Presley. Pat Boone. That guy for that rock and roll and twist. And the natives trying to see that act while I'm jerking their head. Act like that. The natives didn't look at it. But you see, there are Americans like Pat Boone and Elvis Presley and Ricky Nelson and them guys are. They're not Judas's of that type. But they see, it's the spirit. And the spirit is not only in America. It spreads up out over the world. We're we'll bringing them to the battle of Armageddon. They act like that. Whether they are, whatever nation they come from, Africa, India, wherever it is, that vulgar and stuff is spread all over the earth. But just one man started. God has the gospel and the power of Almighty God is spread out over the world. And the separation time is now taking place when God's are calling a bride yeah. and the devil's calling a church. Yeah. That may be part of the bride. Yeah. Let's pray. Dear God, uh, we see the handwriting on the wall. We're at the end time. We know that there's great things leading ahead. But yet somewhere, somewhere out in this mess out here is still honest people that's been ordained to life. It would be impossible for one man or two men, but God, all of us together, let us spread in every corner we can the good news that Jesus is coming. And see, just spread a little bread along, a little word. Wherever the eagles are, they'll follow that food. Whether it comes by a tape or whether it comes by a word or a testimony, eagles will follow it to its headquarters. Mm-hmm. Or it's written where the carcass is, there the eagles will gather. 
Here, Jesus, we know that thou art the carcass that we eat. Thou art the Word. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We pray, God, that when we scatter the Word, that the true eagles will find it. Let us not be ashamed when we stand in before people, wicked, indifferent people, religious, whatever it is. As Paul told Timothy, let's be instant in season, out of season. Be through in rebuking with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they'll not endure sound doctrine, but as to their own love shall heap for themselves together teachers having itching ears and will be turned from the truth to faith. God, we're living in that day. You've let me live long enough to see that happen. And that lays right here in the cornerstone of this tabernacle today of 33 years ago. God bless each one in here. If there be one in here, Lord, is not ready to meet you. That they cannot just agree with your word and they haven't met you face to face and know that you not just by an act of some sort of a of a of an exception, like you would a creed or something, but has met the living God. And if they haven't did this, Lord, may they do it right now. I, I believe you're, you're real near at this hour. I don't know who they are. I don't know even if there's any here, but I just feel led to pray to you. Not that the people hear me, or that would be a hypocrite right. God, far be it, I don't want to be a hypocrite. But I pray with a sincerity in my heart. Whoever he or she is that you speak to this morning, may they humbly not be ashamed, but way down deep in their heart, receive you now. Coming this evening and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, following every word, every word. If they've been baptized different or sprinkled forward, remember, we do, Lord. That you said, whosoever shall take one word out of the book, add one word to it, his part will be taken from the book of life. Though he tries, comes, puts his name on the book, it, it won't work. Let's be sincere and humble. Now they're in your hands, Lord. You do with them as you see fit. Or they're yours. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now while we have our heads back, I want you to think real seriously now. I apologize first for being about 15 minutes with you. Now, we want to hum. You just think in your heart now, have I really met God? Just think it real sincerely. Because it won't be too many times, maybe until, maybe the last time now, that we'll meet the voice coming. It's close, friends. Every scripture looks like it's just about full faith. And it might be for your eyes. This might be our last chance. We may be gone for night. I'll go with him, with him all the way. I can't hear. Are you ashamed of me and of my word? Imagine you're laying on your deathbed now. Can you? Then it might be too late, but it isn't right now. Take thy cross. Might have to sacrifice now. Oh, I in your heart answer this. I'll go with him through. Thank you. 
That's what's going on right now. He's judging us. Lord, do you find me guilty? Then forgive me. Truth is just. What do you judge me to be this morning, Lord? Truth is just. Try me, Lord. Should there be any unclean thing in me? Thank you this morning for all these hands. I didn't see one person but what they had their hands up. I thank you, Lord. I, I trust you didn't either, Lord. No one that didn't have their hands up, they're ready to go through the judgment. Judge us, Lord. And if there be any wrong in us, forgive us, Lord, Father. Give us of your mercy. For we don't want to meet your judgments when mercy is not present. So mercy is present now. So we pray, God, that you'll judge us and forgive us of our sins according to your word and your promise. Let us live for you all the days of our life, not being ashamed of the gospel. Now, Father, if it's your will, we're starting three straight Sundays now of meeting. Prepare our hearts for it, Lord. Prepare me, O oh God. I'm the one that's standing so deeply in need of you. I pray that you'll guide me and direct me in the things that I should do and say in these days to come. God, and direct our precious brother Neville, that gallant servant of yours, Lord. And also, Brother Man, and the deacons of the church, and the trustees, and every person that assembles here. Prepare us, Lord, that we might be able, in a, a real Christian way, to bring sinners uh, to you, and to bring church members to a knowing the God that we know, that we have met personally. Let him become their God, too. Now, Father, this we cannot do. We cannot send them in. But thou, Holy Spirit, move upon the people, the members of churches. And the little experience I had with you the other morning, go get my son a bride. Take it from among the people, among the churches. Pull out that bride. Let me... In prayer now, Lord, you send to Rebecca. I'll try to be the Eloise. Help me to be a faithful servant. May the God of heaven send his angel before me, for us, that we'll cut the things together and select the bride that you have chosen. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I'm sorry you kept me a little late. 25 after I should have been out here 25 minutes ago. But now, you like that old song? Take the name of Jesus with you. Isn't it pretty? I've sang that now for some 33 years as a distance song. Water baptism, the old Jordan stormy banks I stand. I think this is so pretty. Just take it everywhere you go. Precious name.
somebody to be baptized to, or a, to be baptized immediately at this service. If the rest of you, anybody wants to be baptized, we'll have baptismal services at every one of these services. The only thing you have to do is ask. We're ready to baptize you. That's our duty to baptize you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's our duty to do it. And we'll be glad to do it any time. You are to be baptized. Just go to the rooms and meet the after service and uh, we'll go right after the water baptism. Anybody wants to follow them? You'll be sure that we're here. If you have repented of your sin and you've accepted Jesus as your Savior, you've been a Christian for years and never seen the light, and the light of deliverance has come out of a woman, a bride, that must take the name. Jesus said, I came in my Father's name, and you received me not. But there will be one come in his own name, and you'll receive him. That's your denomination. Any son comes in his Father's name. I come in my Father's name. You may come in your Father's name. And what was his name? What is the name of the Father? Jesus. He came in my Father's name. You receive me not. Now, his bride will have his name, of course. I took a woman by the name of Roy, and she became a friend. He's coming for our bride. Be sure to remember that as you come to the pool. Let us bow our heads now. Brother Vail here is no stranger to us. He's a very precious brother. He's been with me many meetings, him and his wife. And he's also now the writer of these sermons and things that goes into the book for him. Brother Vail, would you just miss us in prayer while we bow our heads? I've waited 15 years for this uh, time. But it's a little from the end of My heart has longed to see you again ever since I left you. My heart is for long and it's been to the east and the east and the I have uh, prayed very much. I could try to get to get to come back. Uh, and to get to get to get to get to get to get a few weeks ago, I was under great anticipation, believing that I would get to come and have a meeting. A few weeks ago, I had a lot of great expectations, and I knew that I would come and hear the vergaderings of the house. But when I got the visa restricted, but to get the best visa, I almost had a heart attack. I wanted to come so bad. But I said, "Buy a car, go home." But I still believe, but I hope for that through God, dear God, I will minister again. I shall be a believer in the name of the Lord Jesus, and the name of the Lord Jesus among the people of Africa. Yes. Certain the folk of Africa. God has promised, God has delivered, to give us the desire of our heart, and on all the desires of our heart to give. And that's one of the desires of my heart. And this is one of the desires of my heart. I can remember the great meetings here in Johannesburg. I can remember the great meetings here in Johannesburg. I remember the boy with the short leg coming along again, normal. I can remember the scene to him there, where he was being a little shorter than normal, and he was being normal again. And the lady that the little girl was healed from a back condition, and her mother fainted and fell back in the car. That was my last cousin. You. Die die dame wat wat gezond gemaakt was van die van die rugmoeilijkheid, nu dat haar moeder die haar vleugel wordt. There's so many great things. Dat is baie groot dinge. No doubt that many of those people attended those meetings. Geen twee van die dat baie van die mense hier het daar die dienste bijgewoon. Oh, with the Lord now. Die wat daar die dienste bijgewoon het, het nou saam met die Heere. I have gotten old too since then. Ek het ook een bietje ouder gewat, sê die dienst. It won't be too long till my time to go up. It's only a very long time until my time will come up to come. Then we will be together forever. Then we will stand here for all day. No visas. Then we will not be visas. I would feel like bringing message. I feel like I'm going to have a gift of some bring. It is written in the scripture. Now that it is in the scripture, it's clear. You can just see through the things that are Caesar's. But that doesn't tell you to look what doesn't tell you to come. And to God, the things that are God. And I'm hot with clear what I'm hot to come. I'm expecting to meet you here in a few moments. I'm expecting to meet you here in a few moments. Shake your hands. Put your hands together. And have a good day.
had fellowship again together. I appreciate all these fine men. I wish I had all my brethren in Africa here today. Of all the denominations. That we could just get together and talk all evening. And I would like to hear what the Lord's been doing over here for you. I would like to tell you what he's doing for us across the sea. Maybe you'll permit that someday. Until that day, I'll be praying for you. And you'll be praying for me. God bless you. I wish I had all my brethren in Africa here today. Of all the denominations. That we could just get together and talk all evening. And I would like to hear what the Lord's been doing over here for you. I would like to tell you what he's doing for us across the sea. Maybe you'll permit that someday. Until that day, I'll be praying for you. And you'll be praying for me. And for me.